Today I want to talk about three subtopics going into one topic. One is the nuclear non-proliferation. The other is the Middle East free of nuclear weapons. And then the Iran nuclear deal. And bringing them together, how these are related or should be. Uh, if you don't mind, I would have the talk. And then when I'm finished, I will go for the questions. So let me talk about first about NPT and how we are going into that. First, what we have in the international community agenda, what's being discussed in different fora of the United Nations and other international organizations are the issues of complete disarmament. When we talk about complete disarmament, we are talking about all weapons of mass destructions. And also a limit to some conventional ones that can, can, should also be banned. Then the agenda, the priority of the international community is non-proliferation. What non-proliferation is saying that we know some states have these weapons. Let's put a cap on it. Not let any other states have it. But there is a provision there. The provision is that we are not going to have more countries added to the list of those who hold weapons of mass destruction so that the countries who hold these weapons, like nuclear weapons, come up with a program to dismantle them. We go towards nuclear disarmament. Non-proliferation does not mean that we are going to have a group of states forever holding nuclear weapons and the rest not. It comes with a provision. And the third one is counterterrorism. That is what to make sure that the non-state actors do not get hold of nuclear weapons. In this area, the third area, there is a good cooperation between states. And all the states, they know that having non-state actors, which are non-controllable, they, they cannot be controlled, having weapons of mass destruction would be also bad for them. So in the third one, there is good cooperation. Now going to NPT, there was this recognition that the nuclear weapons are against international law. They are against international law because they are inherently discriminate. They cannot recognize between civilians and military personnel. They cannot recognize between civilian areas, cities, and military installations. So based on international humanitarian law, they are recognized as it was the case of uh, International Court of Justice, ICJ, in 1996, giving an advisory opinion that nuclear weapons use is not justified under international law. Now, during World War II and shortly after, for UK and Russia, or Soviet Union at the time, they got hold of nuclear weapons. US made it during the war, the other two after, shortly after the war. Then France, then China. And this date, when China comes in, is important. Because the NPT talk started in 1965. After these five countries 
had the nuclear weapon and tested and had explosions, then the NPT drafts were given by the US and USSR. To be, and the discussion started at that time. It took from 1965 to 1968 to negotiate it, and it, be, uh, it actually became in force in 1970. The definition of the nuclear weapon states was that the countries that have manufactured and exploded a nuclear weapon or, or other nuclear explosive prior to January 1967. So it covered all five of them. There was another country that also had a nuclear weapon by December 1966, but had made no explosion, and that was Israel, but had no explosion. So in the definition that was agreed, Israel did not fit into that definition for the nuclear weapon states. Now the nuclear, they had to discuss this NPT because they were going to limit the technology to many countries and this technology had peaceful purposes. It could be used for weapons too, but they had peaceful purposes. So there needed to be a balance so that countries would join NPT. Otherwise, they wouldn't have. And the area of the overlap was the enrichment of the uranium. So the uranium that was needed had to be enriched, but there are different enrichment concentration for weapons and non-weapons use. And in order to make sure that countries enriching uranium are not diverting it into weapons, they came up with the inspection system. They called it safeguards. And in 1993, through an initiative which was called 1993 plus two, with the goal of finishing the negotiations by 1995, they came up with an expanded version of safeguards, which was called Comprehensive Safeguard Agreement. And countries who accepted these Comprehensive Safeguard Agreements, they have strict inspections of their facilities, military and non-military, and they are foolproof. But not all countries have joined in there. The Article 4 of the treaty allows countries to have peaceful application of nuclear explosions. Now, there are 31 countries that use nuclear technology to generate power. Some of them, they generate more than 50% of their electricity needs through nuclear uh, technology. 24 out of this, those 31, they have no nuclear weapons. And two states that have nuclear weapons have no nuclear program. They are not using them for generating electricity. So when the 1970, the countries got together and started this entry into force of the NPT, they agreed for a life of 25 years. And that was because they wanted to evaluate the work that has been done by the nuclear states towards disarmament. The preparatory committee started in 1993. 
as a diplomat at time and director general for international affairs from the ministry, I went to all these meetings in New York. And the mood was among non-nuclear weapon states, especially non-aligned countries, that we want to make sure that the nuclear weapon states move towards denuclearization. But things were different. I was a diplomat during Cold War II. After the Cold War, international relations was different. Diplomacy was different. The meetings were directed differently. If the, new, if the Cold War was still there, 1995, they would have not extended it indefinitely. But it was no Cold War. Russia was still asleep. Putin was not there yet. And China had just started its economic program of developing itself to an economic giant and did not take any action that would jeopardize that. So did not get involved. So what you had were the Western countries and the non-aligned countries. A lot of discussion went on. And although many of the non-aligned countries regret it now, but we gave in. We accepted the indefinite extension of NDPT. But there were conditions for it. Conditions were that we will review it every five years and to make sure that the nuclear weapon states would move towards denuclearization. They should show progress. And another issue that got the Arab states into extended indefinitely was having a nuclear weapon-free zone in the Middle East. So there was a decision on that too. In the package deal, and I emphasize on that, it was a package deal. They agreed for indefinite extension with a review every five years to gauge the progress of the nuclear states towards denuclearization. And in addition to the three decisions, there was a resolution, creation of Middle East nuclear weapon-free zone. After it was completed in 1995, that was the end of any cooperation between non-aligned and the Western countries, nuclear weapon states. And then later, of course, Russia joined in that. Starting 1996, the policies of the Western countries change regarding denuclearization. We talked for three years to come up with CTBT, Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. I was involved in the discussion of that in Geneva, in the Conference on Disarmament. The nuclear weapon states didn't join. It is still not ratified. It has not entered into force yet. It's still in preparatory situation. Starting again, 1996, United States, and then later after 2000, Russia, did not accept to talk about a treaty on fissile material that is used for centrifuges. So in every review conference, 2000, 2005, 2010, all these issues came up. 
no progress. But still the final document came out, hoping that we would have denuclearization. But in 2015, the non-aligned countries stopped that. They did not allow to have a final document. And they insisted that the P5 should take steps toward denuclearization. And another issue was the Middle East nuclear weapon free zone. Both of them stopping the final document. So the next review conference would be in 2020. We have to see whether that could become a success. Now the creation of nuclear weapon free zones was in Article 7 of NPT. And it was seen as a path towards complete nuclear disarmament. And based on those countries in the regions, they would get into what is called legally binding treaties, and they would get negative security assurances from the P5, meaning that they would not be attacked or threatened to be attacked with nuclear weapons. Therefore, there is a need for the P5 to confirm those nuclear weapon free zones. And this is the map of the five nuclear weapon free zones that we have. The only one that the United States has not entered or has not verified it yet is the one in Southeast Asia, which has some limitation for using the international waters and airspace in that region, which the US does not accept. Now moving to the Middle East free zone. In December 1966, it was agreed, it was many people argue, and there are documents for that, that Israel had its first bomb. And it had material to make more bombs in a period of eight weeks. That period is important. That shows what capacity of centrifuges they have to enrich uranium to enough capacity to be used for a bomb. And eight weeks is relatively a short period. Now in May of 1967, Egyptian jets flew over Dimona. That is the nuclear facility of Israel. And remember, they do not generate electricity. They have no use for nuclear power. It was a nuclear facility for nuclear weapons. Israelis were concerned that Egyptians have found out about the program, and many argue that that was the reason Israel attacked Egypt and started 1967 war. Some say that there were other reasons, and Israel had information about other plans, but this could be one of the reasons. So in 1974, Egypt and Iran, they come up with the idea of Middle East nuclear weapon free zone. The idea goes to the General Assembly and the countries vote for it. No objection. And from 1980 to 2018, Every year, a resolution is passed by General Assembly for the establishment of the zone in the Middle East without any objection. No vote is taken. Un until 2018, Israel requested the vote. And US and Israel were the two countries who opposed the resolution. And the resolution, of course, passed. But diplomatically, in the work of the UN, this shows a new policy. It shows 
that Israel and the U.S. would try to attract more countries to vote with them to oppose this resolution. They are not going to permit it to move forward. This is the meaning of taking it to a vote. It sends a diplomatic message. In addition to the GA, we had Security Council resolutions on the region and also IAEA decisions covering the need for safeguards in all countries in the Middle East. Other steps related to it, 1981, the Iraqi nuclear reactor is attacked by Israel. 2007, the Syrian nuclear reactor is attacked, again by Israel. And in 2010, Israel sends a Stuxnet malware. It makes it unoperational for the, Iranian, for the Iran's nuclear facility to operate. It took more than six months, close to a year, to repair that. But the policy was clear. Israel would not allow anyone in the Middle East to get even close to nuclearization. Israel wants to remain the only country in the Middle East with nuclear power. Now, going back to the 2010 NPT review conference, Egypt pushes for a resolution and United States, United Kingdom and Russia, they all agree to convene a conference on the subject in 2012. No progress was made, and the three countries did not discuss it with Secretary General of the UN to plan for the conference. So what happened in 2015, Egyptians, as the spokesperson for the Arab League, they came out with the suggestion to have only Secretary General of the UN to convene the conference by March 2016. And there would be no need for the countries, US, UK, and Russia, to make any effort. That resolution was opposed. So in 2015 NPT conference, one of the reasons that the final document was not agreed upon, in addition to lack of progress by the nuclear states, was the fact that, again, they opposed moving towards a Middle East free of nuclear weapons. So Egyptians, they changed the tactics. Instead of going to UN, it's going, instead of going to NPT, excuse me, for having this conference held, they went to the first committee. In the General Assembly, the non-aligned have the vote. So they went to the first committee, they came out with this, this uh, resolution to have the Secretary General of the UN to convene a conference and continue every year until we have a nuclear weapon free zone in Middle East. There would be no break. Efforts would be continuous. The only three countries voting against it were Israel, United States, and Micronesia. And these small states voting in the UN, uh, they have a significance. Uh, 50, 60 under, underdeveloped countries, mostly island countries, uh, they very much rely on the, all the assistance that they get from nuclear weapon states. And you would see in many resolutions, they vote this way or the other. And they have to act. 
I'm, not, I'm just trying to say Macronesia has nothing against a, a Middle East nuclear weapon-free zone. It's just that they have to vote on that way. I wanted to talk stories about this, but I see that the time is short, so I'll move on. Now we come to the JCPOA. In 2002, Iran and the three European states, UK, Germany, and France, they start talking about the concerns that in the, they had about the Iran's nuclear program. These talks continued until 2013. Now, many people say that these more than 12 years, it was not all negotiations, and it's true. Much of them was posturing, trying to use leverages to kind of show that both of them would have a win-win situation. So, but in 2013, they agreed to go into the negotiation. And what they achieved was considered a big achievement for diplomacy. They stopped every pathway to nuclear weapons for Iran, and they agreed to lift the sanctions gradually, not fully. Now, they started it in 2013. And the point that started it, and this is what was changed from 2002 at the time of Bush administration, Bush Jr., and coming to Obama. President Obama was the first one who agreed that he's going to have an interim agreement, just an agreement just to start the negotiations, to put secondary sanctions on hold. So he did not use the way that the others were using to just use all the force of sanctions and starve the people until they accept to negotiate, which they never did. The only thing that may change the attitude for negotiation was that President Obama came up with this idea of an interim agreement at the beginning of the negotiations. Temporarily lifting secondary sanctions, and I will uh, explain the secondary sanctions, and then going into negotiation, first for one year, which was extended for another year. And then by the end of the second year, they finished the negotiations and came out with an agreement. The result was a 109-page document. Five areas they had agreement. Uranium stockpile. Iran had 10,000 kilograms of uranium. They agreed to only keep 300, which was needed for the nuclear reactor. Enrichment. Iran was enriching more than 20%. Agreed to bring it down to 3.67. Centrifuges. These are the machines which are needed to enrich uraniums. Iran had more than 19,000 centrifuges. Agreed to drop it to 6,000 1,000 of which was for research and development where the fissile material would not be injected to it. So actually 5,000 was used for the reactor. And they agreed with a very tough inspection regime, agreeing to temporarily apply comprehensive safeguard agreements until 2023, 
where if the sanctions were removed permanently by US Congress, they would also permanently agree comprehensive safeguard agreements. And the, for the four, Iran got sanctions relief. And the relief was for sanctions imposed by the UN, and these were for the resolutions Iran got from 2006 to 2012 at the Security Council. And those resolutions were going to be canceled and the sanctions of those UN sanctions would be canceled, and the secondary sanctions of the US would also be canceled. Now the secondary sanctions have an effect. In US law, secondary sanctions is sanctioning any company which deals with Iran. So primary sanctions is when US refuses to deal with any country. Secondary sanctions are when US punishes anyone who works with those countries. So what US agreed was to remove the secondary sanctions. And that was enough for Iran. Removing the UN sanctions and the secondary sanctions, it was enough for Iran. And what was other outcomes in addition to nuclear issues and the sanction was that there was a re-engagement between Iran and the West. Many people saw for the first time since 1979 revolution in Iran that US, Iran, and the West are talking about issues which are important to them in the Middle East. On the sidelines, there were many instances that Foreign Minister Zarif and Secretary Kerry, they talked about the situations in Syria, Yemen. And this could have opened up new possibilities for peace in the Middle East. But there were opponents to it. First, the opposition of President Trump, which my belief is that he opposed anything that comes with the name of Obama. I don't think he knew what this agreement is. I do not believe he knew the benefits of this agreement. And I think as he has proved in any, on many other domestic issues, he just didn't want Obama to live with a legacy. But there were those in the White House who were against it, now in Trump administration. Ideologically, there are those who believe there have to be regime change in any country that does not accept capitulation of the US. If those, of course, those people were not there during Obama administration, so it could move on, but with Trump administration, they tried to do everything to make sure this deal is broken. And there are also conservatives in US Congress, and also lobbies, which are against the deal. Outside is Israel and Saudi Arabia, none of which wanted better relations between Iran and the West. They saw that as a threat to their continuous, let's say, primary position with the West. And also conservatives in Iran. They did not like it. They didn't want a moderate administration to move closer to the US. Now, you all know about the withdrawal of the United States, so uh, I would just move on because I don't have much time. And let me, uh, you know what has happened since then. Let me, one minute, and a 
come to the analysis. You know what has happened since Trump administration has withdrawn and what steps Iran has taken. Those articles that I uh, sent before, those explain the situation. So my view is that in the US, Trump will not return to this deal. It's impossible. And what is also evident that 18 months after this maximum pressure policy, the policy has not been effective. So for US, what remains is to double down. They don't want to back off. So what would happen is that politically, the, relation, the relations between Iran and the US would become worse. There is the probability of a military confrontation. And it's almost clear for everyone that the US is pushing for regime change. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into the uh, cases what the US has done to have that regime change has happened. But uh, hopefully we will discuss it in the course on Iran. Now in Iran, the hardliners would not permit the moderates to negotiate with the US. And there is no support now for the negotiations. Everyone know this is a red flag. So what happens, while the US is using its leverages, which is the economic power, sanctions, Iran is also building up its own leverages. What are their leverages? Going back to the situation before 2013. And they have already started on that, on four phases. The difference is that this time, this, what Iran is not doing is not against international law. Because the agreement, the JCPOA, based on Article 36, permits the parties to refrain from implementing their commitments if the other side is not implementing its commitments. And although Iran has taken four steps towards lessening its commitments, the European Union and Russia and China are still behind the agreement. And they do not believe a violation has happened. So Iran would also continue with the building of its leverages. And they would go back to 2013. But in addition to that, Iran has leverages in the region. And it will show its power. And that would be also against having peace and stability in the region. Uh, do I have five minutes, Phil? OK. Uh, let me just go to the Middle East. When we talk about Middle East, and when we want to talk about the Middle East we nuclear weapon-free zone, we have to know what region we are talking about. This is a very troubled region. This is a complex region. Since the Ottomans broke off all the Arab countries, we have had no peace in the Middle East. The situation is not good for the people there. The major powers are running the country. The oil is being sold at a price that is 10 times cheaper than what it should be if you compare the prices of 1970s and 80s to the current prices. Where since 1980s, the price of every commodity that the Middle Eastern countries have to import has gone up 10 to 20 times, the price of oil has not. And therefore, the leaders in the Middle East of the oil producing countries, they have to get their legitimacy from the Western powers. Otherwise, they would not rule there. They are there to make sure oil flows freely to the West. If oil goes above 100, you would have recession in the Western countries. 
If it continues for six months, it would be bankruptcy. It is very critical why Middle East is like that. And since we cannot change that, at least what we can do is to move toward the Middle East where it has no nuclear weapon. And this is where I come to the, let me just show you the expenditures of armaments in Middle East. Just this circle shows it. Look at how much money is being spent on military weapons only in 2018. Saudi Arabia was third in 2018 in terms of military expenditures. These are billions of dollars. Seven out of 10 countries with highest military burden are in the Middle East. Now, I'll finish in two minutes, please. <laughs> uh, what I'm trying to understand is that what is the reasoning behind maintaining the current balance of power in, in terms of nuclear and other weapons in the Middle East. Now, there is now a monopoly of nuclear weapons in the hand of nine countries. If we believe, and we, I mean international community, that deterrence works, and that is why we don't have a nuclear war, so we should have the nuclear weapons maintained in the hands of all these nuclear powers, then, by that reason, Israel should not be the only country having a nuclear weapons in the Middle East. If the reasoning works globally, it should work regionally. But I'm not advocating that. I, I think this is bad, this is wrong. What we need to have is a nuclear weapon world. And in order to get there, we should have a nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East. And for that to happen, in any renegotiation of the Iran nuclear deal, the Middle East weapon free of nuclear weapons, a Middle East free of nuclear weapons should be included in this new agreement. Next to it, next to Iran, getting rid of all nuclear, uh, any material that might get help it get to nuclear weapons, there should be also this understanding that the balance of power means that also no other country in the Middle East should have nuclear weapons. I will end it there, Philip, and open for questions. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth. First of all, I want to thank you for speaking here tonight. I guess my question is, how does Trump pulling out of the deal that was agreed upon by Obama change any possible future negotiations when they might just feel that it's worthless because the next president will just do what one president already did? That is, you're correct. And uh, that is, of course, the outcome. And I don't think President Trump understands what he's doing, not only on the Iran issue, on the issue of trade, on the issue of Paris Pact. He does not understand the message that he's giving to world. That by going back on these agreements that US, there has been no revolution in the United States. There has just been a government change based on the vote of the people. Once you go back on these things, you are actually eliminating any power that the US has in the negotiations. It eliminates the moral power of the US when these negotiations are uh, starting and they are being held. 
And no other countries, as you said, they would trust. They would always hold back, always make sure that they keep their leverages. And that is not good in, in international and multilateral negotiations. I got three questions going here, so four. Hi, my name is Cyrus. So uh, when a Western power builds a nuclear reactor for a nation, is that a type of political recognition? As you can see with the examples of the reactors of Iraq and Iran built by the French? Uh, reactors can be made. There is, they can be built. There is no restriction. NPT members uh, can freely make nuclear reactors. It's just that they have to agree to safeguards. And safeguards would make sure that those materials are not diverted toward military purposes. Hi, my name is Flint. Uh, my question is around a line that you mentioned, or not a line, but you said something that said really the only thing left for the U.S. at this point in time is to not back down because the economic sanctions that are going to at this point in time are not working. That sounds awfully reminiscent of what we decided to try to do in Vietnam. Um, and even though Trump may not necessarily be kind of with that, do you think that there's any danger for those countries to kind of take advantage of that and realize, okay, well, they have to keep the pressure on them. We can sort of just lure them into a trap and get a lot more out of them than we might otherwise. Uh, let me uh, go back into the issues of the sanctions. Uh, the sanctions are used by the U.S. administration at, at different times as a tool to change the policies of other countries. We have had economic embargo and sanctions on Cuba for more than 50 years. Since 1992, every year, a resolution in General Assembly of the UN has passed condemning those sanctions. International community is all against that. But there is no power to change it. U.S. is the greatest economy in the world. Now, if they decide to, uh, if they decide to use that power responsibly, then you would not have the situations that you have. But once they use that economic power as a military tool, and President Trump has said that, that he's using the economic sanctions as a military tool to starve the people to make the regime change. This will not work. As I'm saying that nothing is going, Cuba, it has not worked for more than 50 years in Cuba. It, had, it didn't work on Venezuela. It will not work on Iran. But this is the message that the US is sending. Uh, and I think most of it is more for, for domestic purposes than thinking that it will change anything on the ground. Sure, and they may also use the impetus to then increase, the way that I took it when you said that was like, well, if they have to keep the pressure on, sanctions are only to begin, right? So what's the stop the current administration from just pushing harder and putting people there or something like that? True. Uh, next victim. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your talk. I really appreciate that. And uh, you mentioned that there are three countries against okay, the, uh, I believe it's the Egypt issue, it's, uh, uh, Israel, Micronesia, and US. I'm really curious why Micronesia holds against this issue. Could you just explain very sharply? Thank you. Well, I tried. Uh, because of shortage of time, I could not go into detail. There are many countries, small countries, with uh, small populations, with no viable economies, and their budgets is all the foreign aid they get. And they are pushed by the countries that who provide these aid to vote on different resolutions without having I mean, you could not imagine that Micronesia has a policy that Middle East should not, should ha continue to have nuclear weapons. It, 
It's not logical. They have to do it. And in 1980s, when I was a diplomat at the UN, during a General Assembly meeting, when the President of Iran, who is now the current leader, supreme leader in Iran, he was speaking, uh, members of organizations against Iran, they got access to the General Assembly and tried to divert the attention. Of course, they were expelled by the UN security. And once the UN security went and we, required, we requested to be investigated, the UN security came out that these Iranians had the badges of diplomats of St. Lucia. So I had to go to the ambassador of St. Lucia and ask him what is the meaning of this. And while he apologized, he said that he, this is the orders from State Department. I'm sorry, I have to carry them on. This is simple, as simple as that. So if you see small countries voting, it's just that they have to. Iran is not going to change its stand regarding Macronesia or St. Lucia. It, they know. What is the situation on that? Good evening, my name is Maria. Um, it seems like from a lot of the readings that Trump was implicated in um, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, do you think that he will be held accountable for being part of that in the future? I think that requ requires a long talk <laughs> about the issues of human rights and the violations of human rights and the jurisdiction of the states, and I don't think we have time for this. Another setting. Hello, my name is Alexi. Thank you very much for coming in today. Um, you mentioned that the US uh, at this point can only double down on what they've already said, and it would make political relations more complex or worse. Um, I was just wondering, with presidential elections so close, do you think it would be possible for any future president to improve the situation? Or would they have to continue the maximum pressure policy? Well, it all depends to the policies and the administration. Already, all the Democratic candidates, candidates of the Democratic Party, has said that they would go back to the deal. Now, what would happen if President Trump is re-elected? We have to wait and see. But there is also this belief that maybe if he is re-elected, his second term would be different from the first term, as many presidents are. Good evening, Dr. Marcus. My name is Sal. I was in one of your classes. My question is regarding the JCPOA. Uh, one of the major criticisms is that it uh, limited a cap of the number of centrifuges for only 10 years. And on top of that, uh, the limit for the cap uh, enrichment of uranium was for 15 years maximum. And Iran is a member of the NTP was found uh, in multiple violations previously, even though it signed the uh, NTP. What makes us believe that Iran will follow through if any other new treaties are made under uh, the non-proliferation treaty? Uh, we have examples like North Korea, for example, that was part of the NTP, and then they were found in violations of that. Uh, First, for North Korea, they are not a member of MPT anymore. They left the MPT. So, but for the members of NPT, there is a safeguard system. And what Iran agreed in this JCPOA is that in 2023, Iran would agree to a comprehensive safeguards, which would forever put all the installations under the control of IAEA, military and non-military, with access with short notice. So that would eliminate any possibility. And remember, NPT allows countries to have enrichment. It is only that the, those, the uranium is not diverted to military purposes. So if there is the comprehensive safeguards, 
their job, the job of those inspectors, is to make sure that everything is clear. And I don't think that based on this agreement, there was any doubt that once these deals come to a, a 2023 and also in 2025 and then other provisions, there was any doubt that there would be more safeguard agreements that would eliminate any possibility of any diversion. But the start of the negotiations in 2002 was based on this information that these Europeans had that Iran was diverting for military purposes. And the questions of possible diversion to military purposes was resolved in IAEA in 2015, and they closed that book. Uh, I was just kind of curious, when it comes to negotiations on the part of Iran, um, how are the diplomats selected? Are they vetted through the IRGC, the Ayatollah? Is it a meritocratic process? Um, like how, how is it determined who gets to negotiate the sanctions and what they want to agree to? Well, getting to the diplomatic core of Iran is not different from any other country. You join the foreign ministry, as here you join the State Department, there are different ways of joining the diplomatic corps. Uh, there are entry exams, uh, then uh, there are uh, those who are appointed for political purposes, it's like the US, many ambassadors are appointed politically, they are not diplomats. And it's the same in every country, it's nothing different. Uh, but in Iran, it just happened that at the time, these diplomats were there. They were the diplomats. And the foreign minister was Dr. Zarif, uh, who was my classmate in University of Denver. We graduated together. And he was my boss for 20 years. And for you to just know the background of the Iranian government officials and diplomats, in the past 40 years, more than half of the government officials of the UN, you have the Iran, are educated in US and Europe. So, and there is no limitation, there is no restriction on that. It's just looking out for the interest of the country as a diplomat. Do I answer your question? So one of Trump's campaign messages was making a better deal with Iran. So in the context of the attempt to renegotiate a deal, would the US have a weaker hand in negotiations since its credibility has been damaged? And furthermore, if there was another deal, would improved relationships with Iran moderate the nation? Well, it all depends how, how the negotiations would start. As I said, with the current policies that the Trump administration has, I do not see any renegotiation to start. Now, if the conditions change, of course, that would change the situation, and you might have a case where negotiations could start. But you are correct. If the negotiations restart during Trump administration, this time the diplomats would be more careful, and they would not spend all their leverages. And they would try to make sure that the win-win situation does not change to a win-lose situation. Uh, if there is any prospect of a win-win situation, resolution and negotiations could start. If Iranians are convinced that the negotiations are going to be win-lose, there is no need to start negotiations. I would never get into such negotiations knowing from the beginning that I'm not going to gain anything. If, for example, the goal of the United States was regime change, that's going to make negotiations very different. And, and the 12 conditions that Secretary Pompeo put, at the end, those meant regime change. 
But if there was a good deal and it managed to stay for long term, would that result in a more moderate Iran? Of course. Uh, if the if the situation changes with the West and there is less tension and there is improved economy, moderates would have stronger hands. And, and that is what happened uh, in 2013. And the re-election of the president. But I'm afraid the hardliners are uh, getting stronger because of the current situation. No one knows what would happen in the next presidential elections. So before I start randomly calling on people. Any other questions? All right. Let's thank our speaker for